Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China-Europe relations have shown signs of recovery since the visits by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and the European Council President Charles Michel last winter. And a new wave of recent diplomacy has been on the rise, including the just-concluded visit by Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and the upcoming visits by French President Emmanuel Macron and the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in early April. Can this recent diploma, diplomatic surge help China-Europe relations bounce back and ushering smoother ties? What role does Europe expect China to play in resolving the Ukraine crisis? And can Europe withstand Washington's constant pressure to decouple from China? To answer these questions and more, earlier I interviewed Zhou Rui, chairman of the Bridge Tank, and Martin Jake, author of When China Rules the World at the Boa Forum for Asia. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thank you, Joe, for talking to us. We're a speaker for this, uh, the world, of course, in the uh, European uh, continent. There's uh, in the, the Ukraine conflict and the crisis you know, geopolitically. And the uh, US, you have this banking meltdown. Um, obviously, the world is a bit uh, struggling <laughs> in terms of uh, dealing with all those issues. And European leaders, uh, they are visit to China, you know, including that of the Spanish Prime Minister, President Macron, and of course uh, the EU uh, Commission President uh, van der Leyen, and later on probably more European leaders. What's their priority? Well, two priorities in fact. Of course to discuss Russia and Ukraine, and also to see, I guess, how to envisage being back in business. We, we'll see what President Macron and Mrs. van der Leyen will say, but we've heard this morning Pedro Sanchez very clearly. On the first point, on the Ukraine situation, you've noticed that uh, what people call the, uh, you know, Ukraine uh, troubles or whatever, is clearly labeled by all the official European participants to Boa as the Russian aggression. So this uh, is not just play on words, it, it conveys the political position of Europe, which will be at the heart of discussion, of mutual understanding. And I think that leaders all come to understand what will be the possible exact positions of China as a possible mediator in this aggression uh, war uh, that Russia waged against uh, Ukraine. So that will be a very key issue and that's why they come in person because these are not things that you can discuss through Zoom teams or whatever. So that's very important. But this being said, uh, I could hear uh, um, that the majority of the speech of Pedro Sanchez and it's also what uh, President Macron and Ursula von der Leyen most likely will discuss, will be on resuming economic ties, on trying to see what's the next generation of investment, of uh, trade and of regulations. Because one has to understand that over the last, say, three years, China has changed a lot, the economy of China has changed a lot, the economy of the EU has changed a lot, not just the strategies, but also the economy. So the business communities, uh, uh, the economic communities and the industries have to re-engage with each other. And I think on both sides, that's what we get from being in Boa, on both sides they expect signals from their government. So the fact that Chinese leaders, European leaders talk about the industry, and the business and economy will be important for the real business-to-business -business discussions to resume. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you touched upon a very interesting point about China's possible role as a peace negotiator uh, between Ukraine and Russia or between Russia and the West. Uh, th this is happening against the background of uh, China's efforts to bring Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two rivals, together and reached a deal to resume their diplomatic relationship. Do you think that kind of uh, success uh, provides people with more confidence probably in the Chinese capability or efforts to do something probably substantial in terms of resolving the Ukraine mm. issue here? Mm. Well, it's obviously difficult to assess the future, but there's a clear trend for diplomatic observers of uh, China, which is that on the one hand, China is not new into uh, playing good offices or, and mediation in some conflicts. China had been pivotal in some crises that uh, the world faced on uh, North Korea, for instance. But that used to be limited somehow to 
you know, the neighboring countries of, of China. Then uh, is this move happening which uh, diplomats observed, uh, diplomats had observed that the special envoy of China to the Middle East is a seasoned diplomat, a seasoned Arabist, and that uh, China had engaged more with the Middle East, notably with this great tie-up that China had signed uh, recently, some years ago, uh, with Iran, but uh, the success that China had in bringing two belligerent that are at proxy wars in some places of the Middle East together on the same table of negotiations first. And second, to reach an agreement, and we'll see whether that stands, but that's the responsibility of those two countries, that uh, took the diplomats uh, a bit by surprise. So I think now there's an open, uh, there's o there's an open era where uh, people at the same time don't see clearly what China wants to offer on the Ukraine situation and how they will be able to bring some sense to Russia. There's lack of clarity on that, and again, this is why the leaders are coming. But there are, I wouldn't say expectations, but the world is intrigued by that, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, China probably is also uh, in, a, in a position uh, to negotiate or to provide some room for the parties to negotiate with each other because China is having a strong relationship, let's say, with Russia, and also a very good relationship with the Ukraine, and relatively, I would say, stable relationship with the Europeans, too. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, I mean, uh, if you enjoy this position, somehow you are enabled to bring the parties together. Uh, otherwise, let's say, you know, U.S. is not offering a peace plan, and they are talking about uh, refusal to accept, uh, you know, any ceasefire from the Chinese side, or. Do you think Europeans have this identical views in terms of that? Well, first of all, uh, in, before going to the U.S. position, Europeans, let, let's, let's see what the two nations, the two countries or the two governments are saying. Uh, Russia is not keen to negotiating really, you know. Uh, Ukraine's position is very interesting. Uh, one could observe, an, not a shift, but a modification from the time when the idea of negotiation was mostly conveyed uh, by the press, uh, by some global debates, uh, uh, the Ukrainian government was very clear, saying they refuse negotiations, the, the, you know, and, and, and they, they want to uh, have, at, or at least for the negotiations, they want some strong uh, preliminaries that they regain the borders and etc. When the uh, Chinese, um, not offer, but possibility of uh, Chinese diplomacy entering into the field materialized, uh, they were not that uh, prima facie against, uh, they showed some openness. So that's an interesting evolution already. Now getting back to the European Union, uh, if you observe what has happened since the beginning of the war, uh, the answer of the European Union has been A, uh, started right from the beginning. Three days after the aggression, there was a common reaction, whereas the US took one more month to kind of make a position. B, this position has been constantly progressing, and C, it has prog been progressing in a very controlled manner. So, uh, the European diplomacy, for the European diplomacy, it's a kind of a test for the possibility of a common defense policy in Europe, it's an opportunity but a test as well. So in a sense, you may want to consider that EU will be a reasonable player and a player that will lessen to Ukraine, considering Ukraine, I mean, some countries, some member countries in the EU consider Ukraine as a future de facto member, Man. fellow member, so they will accommodate their views, you know. So. It will be very interesting to see that they will play uh, reason and at the same time play the advocates of Ukraine. Of Ukraine, yeah. Back to China-European relationship. Uh, now, uh, it seems like with these visits, you know, the, as you said, the two sides are resuming their ties, in particularly in the economic and trade uh, sector, let's say. Of course, there's this investment uh, treaty that was suspended in the European Union Parliament over there. 
then there's issue, like if we are saying we are resuming ties, uh, in what area, in what way, are we simply going back to normal? Are we continue to deepen our ties, in particular in the probably economic trade and investment sector? Well, if one observes the industry and the economy, uh, there's never any coming back in time. You know, the economy keeps changing because technology keeps changing. Markets keep changing, the resources distribution keep changing, and etc. So there's always an evolution. So after this kind of lapse, uh, one had, even notwithstanding the shocks that China and the EU both got through COVID, through financial crisis, through now this war or the counter effects, uh, the, the ripple effects of this war, even without that, you never, you wouldn't have got back to the previous uh, time. So I think that's why it's very important to sit, discuss across industries, within industries, across segments of value chains, uh, between leaders, to see what are the next areas of cooperation, what the two economic zones need, because China trails down the line, the crack of COVID has changed, the EU has changed, their global policies have reinforced, alterated, modified, evolved. Uh, and their industries have changed, the companies have changed, so uh, it, it has to come back from, from the bottom, you know, like, uh, uh, and from the field. Mm -hmm. What about the, the long-term prospect of China-EU ties, uh, given, you know, U.S. Uh, competition or confrontation with China, or some would say the U.S. new Cold War against China, you know, EU countries, they are allies of the United States, more or less, they receive the pressure from Washington to align with them in terms of their relationship with China? I, I, I think the concept of allies has to be, uh, the problem with language and semantics is that one word has to be understood differently uh, across uh, different civilizations. The, there's no concept of allies in, in the Chinese civilization. Uh, nor, in the, nor in the Chinese diplomacy. Chi China doesn't want allies, it claims it doesn't want allies. Americans, uh, well, over their history have wanted at some points in time, sometimes not. Uh, remember Mr. Trump, he, he, he needed not allies. Uh, but America can sometimes claim allies in a very encompassing way, including in, in economy. For Europeans, and again you would have a variety within Europe because it's a diverse continent, but for Europeans, the concept of allies is a concept that sticks, that is uh, pertinent at times of war, and that's it, you know. So it's not, uh, and all that refers to security, uh, preventing from cyber attacks, those kind of things, but mm -hmm. until and unless uh, there's a war, the concept of allies doesn't uh, you know, now you can have the concept of some industrial alliances, including in the military technologies, mm -hmm. including in those technologies that can become dual or not, and that, that might call for some regulations. Europeans might want to be thinking about that, follow America from time to time, be proactive in other cases, because uh, the defense industry is, 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 you know, there is a defense industry. In, in, in Europe, which is partly autonomous, partly linked to the, uh, the American defense industry, but this uh, part autonomy is something that uh, Europeans, some European countries want to, want to promote. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there has been a repeated claim by European leaders, both at the EU level and national levels, that mm, Europe doesn't want to follow any uh, bloc in the world and doesn't want to side with any bloc. Is that what we call strategic autonomy? Well, strategical autonomy is uh, something that is also yet to be defined and again on the ground, you know. Uh, uh, it, the, the, there is currently an exercise across Europe to try and define what are the strategic industries. You know, it's not just the defense. Uh, is it the whole value chain? Of course not. So in between this strictly limited exception of what is strategic and uh, an all-encompassing approach, uh, there's no clear definition. So that's also something that will take time and that cannot be thought in isolation. And that's where, again, engaging with the rest of the world is important. I really believe that Europeans 
nowadays European leaders, European industry want to engage with the rest of the world, uh, China included. Recently, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill to ask or to urge the State Department to remove China's status from you know, developing country in international relations, uh, international organizations. What do you make of it? Well, you know, we live in interesting times when earlier parliaments, houses of representatives, whatever, used to rule about their territory. You know, because after all, they're elected on a territorial basis and you rule about your own country, which is what you control by law, constitution or, or de facto, you know. Now we've entered into an area, uh, into an era where sometimes parliaments want to rule something, not globally, they understand they're not a global parliament, but they want to rule something at the border, at the frontier, between what is the national measure which has a global impact. So first of all, it's a new evolving role of parliaments and we've seen that uh, in the European Parliament uh, not ratifying uh, the investment, the investment treaty, treaty between China and, and Europe mm -hmm. uh, and this might be the case for some time being for all sorts of reasons and we see that we see that we see that in uh, in, in America even beyond those so-called extraterritorial laws so it's it's a development that we see one has to be careful and cautious that it doesn't hamper diplomacy first of all and that, uh, especially in social media, we don't overplay that. It's not because one country says another one is developing, not developing, emerging or whatnot, that it changes the reality. It's just a signal of what they want to do in a particular peculiar policy. If they want to, if they feel that in terms of evolving partnership and competition, that is either more representative or rare of the way they perceive reality or of their own interest, after mm -hmm. all states have interest, uh, well, they'll do that, irrespective of the name. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you for thank speaking you with so us. Thank you so much. And it's been good to be uh, back good in person. Good to have you. To the show. Yes.